so just like 30 seconds whenever you're ready. Huntington, and it is July 11th, 2017, and I am with and interviewing Mrs. Um, Tremoral Robinson at her residence, and today with me is um, my sound recorder, Caitlin Millett. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> um, and this recording will be available through the UW library system, and it is for the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee BLC Field School in Sherman Park. This interview will last between an hour and an hour and 30 minutes. Um, today, Mrs. Robinson, I want to talk to you about your time here in Sherman Park, your impressions, how you interact with your neighbors, and your ideas about your community. Um, so to start, um, can you tell me about your first impressions of this house when you first walked into it? Before you answer that question, I just, we need to do a verbal... Oh, that's um, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, sorry. Um, first, before we start, sorry about that. Um, do you consent to this recording and me interviewing and then sharing this information? Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, once again with our questions, um, what was your first impression when you initially walked into this house? I believe it was in the 1980s. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was 1984. My daughter was five years old, and when I first walked in the house, I fell in love with it immediately. We were renting it, so I fell completely in love with it. It was beautiful. And what was the thing that just struck you when you first walked in? What was the first thing that struck you? The woodwork. The woodwork, um, big, airy living room, and a uh, nice size dining room, and the woodwork. The wood floors, the wood buffets, the wood trim. That all just hit me right away as soon as I walked in the door. And the stained glass windows also. Okay. Um, how many other houses had you looked at prior to this? We had looked at uh, maybe about five or six because we were renting. So we looked at about five or six homes. Matter of fact, we looked at one of the homes across the street on the corner and it was a real nice size home also nice woodwork uh, big living room they had a huge nice size master bedroom and they also had a fireplace in there which I really liked but that one we didn't get but this one we so happened to fall upon after seeing the ad in the paper that it was a home on the 2600 block of North 40th Street. And I'm like, is that the same home? After they told us that they had rented it already. And I called the number and it was not. It was a um, county supervisor that was renting out the home, which his name was uh, Paul Matthews. And uh, he was getting ready to go out of town. And he said, um, you can come right now and take a look because I'm getting ready to leave out of town and we hurry up because we really needed to get a place at that time and we walked in we were like oh my god I think we like this one better than one across the street and um, he rented out to us right away 
Um, we gave him our security deposit and he gave us the keys. <laughs> and um, he said, well, you know, you pay the first month's rent when the first, first of the month. And we came in and did our little touch because it really, it was already really clean. So we just did our own touches to it, you know, as far as cleaning. And um, we were just in love with it. It was such an easy move. It was so easy to, um, the neighborhood was nice, uh, cozy, and, you know, it was a few children. We had a five-year-old daughter, and um, it was a place that we felt was safe for her to play. Were you, did you know about Sherman Park before uh, actually deciding to move here, and what was your... Um, thoughts about the community? Uh, yes, I was raised in Sherman Park. Um, my mom bought her home on 38th and Roosevelt in 19, I think it was 1973. I was, it might have been 72. I was either 9 or 10 at the time she bought that house. And we was raised on 38th and Roosevelt. So we knew about it. Um, I, um, at that time, we would uh, do summer school programming, and as, as uh, I went to, at that time, it was Peckham Junior High School. It was on uh, Fond du Lac, um, right off of, I, I don't want to say Townsend, but now it, it turned into Jackie Robinson, and now it's a resident for older people now they made it into a so I went to middle school there I also went to Townsend Street on um, Sherman and is that our a sermon in Townsend so I went to school there and so we walked to and from school and I didn't go to Washington High School up the street but I took summer school programming there and um, so we did, you know, whatever we wanted to take, you know, for summer school. I would go to Washington High School. We would walk. Uh, and sometime on the way home, we would kind of make our little way through the neighborhood. And um, I, it was that log, log house on the corner of uh, Clark and um, Sherman. That house always caught our eye because of it was so unusual. It was a little log house made out of logs. But we used to walk through Sherman Park, and it was just a nice, quiet, cozy neighborhood. And my friends and I, we would just chit-chat and walk. And it's always been a nice neighborhood. When we moved over there in 1970, when, in the 70s when we moved with, over there when my mom bought our house, it was so quiet in Sherman Park over there. Till we were like, oh, we're so bored. <laughs> we don't have anybody to play with. <laughs> And, um, but, you know, now as I'm older, I realize that, you know, it was something that was great because my mother still lives there. And it's um, always been, a, I love the houses. Walking down Sherman Boulevard, looking at the homes and different designs of the homes. They were just always really nice homes to me. So I always had a good vision of Sherman Park. Looks a little different now. The um, the the we call them the islands, but it's the uh, medians. Those were full of flowers, and um, on Sherman Boulevard, on Roosevelt Drive, they were also beautiful. And of course, they're not as beautiful as they used to be, but um, you know, it, it's not bad. <laughs> So you talked about walking with your girlfriends. Were those neighbors of yours? Yes, yes. So I had a friend. She lived on Roosevelt and Fond du Lac. Her, um, it was the little short houses. They were green trim. They're still over there. It was on Sherman and Fond du Lac. And then she lived in one of those little, sh they were little short houses. I guess they would consider townhouses because they were side by side. Um, and uh, so most of my friends did live in the neighborhood, and she was one of them, one of my closest friends, who is still my friend now. So let's now shift a little bit to this house when you first moved in. 
were you the only resident or was there someone in the other? Someone was upstairs. They were there prior to us. She um, had been there maybe about five years before we were and um, her and her fiance. And we became uh, pretty good friends. Her fiance and my husband um, became real good friends. Uh, and um, unfortunately, he died in 1986 of a real um, tragic car accident. So uh, she lived there for a while. His fiance lived there for a while, even after we purchased the property. So we purchased the property. We lived here for uh, 10 years, and then we purchased the property from the homeowner who was ready to sell. So she lived here for about a year longer, and then she moved on and purchased her own property. So when you moved here, were there any things that you saw that you needed to change or you wanted to change to fit your family and your family needs? Um, yeah, it was some things that we needed to change. To First of all, it was the house was made out of cedar. And of course, it was not very energy efficient, <laughs> just having the cedar on the house. Um, so um, after we purchased it, we um, had the house insulated uh, by them blowing insulation into the cedar. And we had windows, aluminum windows put on. And uh, we had furnace because our gas electric bill, well, our gas bill was extremely high. Um, so we had new furnace put in uh, and we put ceiling fans up because um, that would kind of keep us a little cooler. We had a central air unit put in to keep us cooler. <laughs> so um, a lot of things, a few things we did change. We put ceiling fans up. Um, and as the years went on, we um, uh, put new toilets in, put a new sink in. My husband made his little man cave down in the basement. Um, as years went on, uh, they had the attic was um, finished, but it was not complete. They had like finished rooms in the attic. And we just pretty much put storage there. But uh, as years went on, my daughter, she moved upstairs after I rented a few times. and. She needed a little more space because it's her and her husband and her kids and plain room for the children and a room for them when they want to go upstairs. and that. So they kind of finished it off up in the attic in the part that was not finished. They finished it off and um, they didn't put any heating or electric in it or anything, but they just finished it off so that it would look nice. And um, they... That's where they go sometimes when they have guests, so they won't disturb us so much. But uh, it's a few things that we had. Then, then years later, we had the um, window, other windows put in, which uh, are the windows. It was through the lead program. Those windows are the windows that they um, energy efficient windows, and um, so we had the lead went through that lead program where they cleared the lead because these houses have lead-based paint in them. Uh, we've uh, had it recently painted. We've had tuck pointing done recently. Uh, and now we just had the glass block windows put in the basement. So it's a few things that we've had done here. I'm trying to think of what else that we have done here. Uh, we did not mess with the woodwork. I'm adamant on that. Some of the stained glass uh, got old and cracked. And we have several pieces down the basement. One got broken a little bit by my grandson, my little. He was young. So he kicking and kicked the glass in one of the, um, in the buffet upstairs. So I have that, getting ready to take it and get that repaired. I would like to get the, the stained glass repaired that was in the door. And um, it was, a, I think I got two pieces down that basement. So I would like to get those repaired. I know it's kind of costly, 
<laughs> so, uh, and one piece my husband threw in the garbage. A whole big door piece. And I told him, I said, why did you throw? Oh, it's no good. I'm like, but it's stained glass. Even if I don't fix it, somebody else will use it. You know, they might take it apart and piece it back together. And he, he just... Oh well, <laughs> but you know it's it's you know a few and there's some things that I still want to do to the home to to update it a little bit more, uh, like get my basement completely finished, have the washroom finished. We've had several new water heaters put in, of course, because water heaters go off go out more often. But we would like to you know finish off, have a nice cozy washroom, so when we go down the basement. We can just kind of sit down and wash and don't have to go up and down the stairs. So did you change any of the uses of the rooms? Yes. The dining room we made into a, it's a formal dining room. We made it into our sitting room. So um, that's one room that we changed. And that's also with the upper unit also where my daughter lives. Um, they she um made that into a formal sitting room because we don't we would probably would not sit here and dine so we like you know would like a sitting room we could have took that back bedroom and did it since our daughter is grown now but this is larger more cozier more open so we use the formal dining area as our sitting room so, with your daughter growing up here, how did she interact with uh, her friends and neighbors um, in the community? They played. They played a lot. She learned how to ride her two-wheeler. As we tried to teach her how to ride, she just could not learn how to ride. But one of the neighbors, a young guy, taught her how to ride. They were able to even play, ride their bike in the alley. And see, I was always strict parent anyways because my uh, mother was strict. She raised us very strict, so we couldn't leave off the block. We had to stay on the block within, I, and I'm like, I was like that also. So all the kids that lived on the block, they used to come here and play. <laughs> So they had to come over here and play, and they played on the porch or in the black backyard. But my daughter could not leave from in front of the house for a very long time until she got a little older. But the kids came down here and played with her. But we let her learn how to ride her bike in the alley because they could play in the alley. I mean, the alleys were clean, and we didn't have to worry. We kept our eye out there, and they could ride their bikes in the alley. I would let her ride her bike. She rode it, learned how to ride it in the alley, but then she had to ride it in the front. We made her ride it on the sidewalk. She would ride from one corner to the other corner. That's how she rode it. She couldn't go around the corner. But one of the young ladies that um, she played with still lives over here. So they're good friends. Um, and uh, she played with most of the kids, boys and girls. They all played together. They got along together. I knew most of the parents, and we consulted with each other as the kids were playing. We didn't let each other, let the kids go in each other's homes unless it was okay with the other parent. And most of the time, we just did not do it. You're playing outside. That's where you stay and play is outside. Enjoy, and the kids could actually play outside and we didn't have any fear of anything okay did you need to get it no okay so you were saying there's no fear of the kids playing outside no there's no kids at that time it was no fear of the kids playing outside other than you know you know the natural thing that we taught our kids, stranger danger and all that. But we didn't have to worry about gunshots. We never heard that as far as fights or anything. No, no big fights. You know, the kids had little, you know, 
little things that went on, you know, ever so often, you know, but not really nothing big, you know, something that they pretty much resolved amongst themselves. A lot of things I probably didn't even know about, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was a safe place for the kids to play. And, um, now it's a little different. And, uh, I don't know if you want me to go into that. <laughs> It's a little different now. Now my grandkids live upstairs and they can't enjoy that like my daughter did. Where my daughter could skate, she skate. The grandkids can't do that. You know, we let them go in the backyard. I have a 15 year old. She's never played, you know, by herself outside. It's always been, if she come outside, it's always been right in front of the house. Usually somebody sitting outside with them in the backyard, you know, just in case, you know, we, you know, you just never know. They've never had to dodge any bullets ever, but, you know, just to know that people are, things have changed so differently that, um, I don't want them to have to experience that. Now they've heard gunshots. They have heard them while we're in the house and it might be, down one way or down the other way. Our block mm, is a little, a little more. Everybody considers us a good block <laughs> for some reason, and I guess it is one of the better blocks. But it's a few more homeowners in on this block also, so that might be a reason. And that um, I um, you, you communicate with the neighbors. You know, we try to know the neighbors, and um, so. Um, it's just a little, it's a lot different. I'll just put it like that. It is a lot different. And I would like to see it safer for our children to play everywhere, not just here, but everywhere. Our kids should be kids. You mentioned that when your daughter was growing up that the parents, you knew most of them and they would kind of look out and be able to see is, do you still think in some ways that's still happening in some aspects? Um, over here, mm, I do know, well, a lot of the people that's over here, I knew them from years ago, the ones that still left. I'm not going to say that that happens a lot over here now. You know, that, you know, kids are playing and you, I even see little bitty kids walking. And I'm like, where are their parents? Because I don't believe in kids, you know, I would walk and hold my daughter's hand. She was about 9 or 10, and I, <laughs> she'd be pulling away from me. But now you don't see that as often. So as far as parents knowing parents, you know, people are, you know, they get in their cars and they go. They get out their cars and go inside. And the kids come outside. And, you know, I try to speak to everybody when I see them. If I see them, I try to speak to them. But... I don't know if everybody has that same mentality nowadays, especially the younger people, older people, a little different. Younger people, mm, everybody's into their own world. And, you know, we have to look at what surrounds us also because that is our world also. It's not just going to and from work or, you know, going to and from. We We need to know our neighbors and we need to, uh, look out for each other, have a caring, you know, a caring feeling about our neighbors because what affects our neighbors can affect us. And uh, a lot of people are afraid to know who is who, you know, because they're afraid of what they might be doing or what they think. And they're afraid of um, police contact. They're afraid of... Um, uh, having involvement with the police as far as working with the community because they don't want people to know that they communicate with the police. And I'm like, well, if everybody communicated with the police, they would know if, you know, we were talking, you know, if it's something going on, whether it's a drug house or whatever is undesirable. If we all talk, then they they can't, you know, it's like divided we fall, united we stand, divided we fall, you know, and that's what's happening for the most part. 
I'm going to talk a little bit because you mentioned that your daughter sometimes would play on the porch. Um, do your grandkids play on the porch like your daughter used to? They don't. They do play on the porch, though, but only with supervision. So if I'm out there, if I'm watering my flowers, I have them come out and help me with flowers. I have my rain barrel on the side, so I have them run back and forth, passing me water, so I don't have to do it. <laughs> bring me water, go get, the rain, go get the water cans, and they bring, and they're so excited to do it. So they help me water. They also water, I water. And then we sit out. Sometimes the ice cream truck comes down and we stop and get ice cream. Uh, but we let them sit out and play, but it's always somebody out here. And um, I just don't feel comfortable with them. Now, in the backyard, we may let them go out in the backyard and uh, play without, um, you know, us sitting out there all the time. We do sit out there with them sometimes, but we, you know, feel a little bit more secure. I just put a fence up back recently because our fence was um had um fell over it just was aged so uh now we probably will feel a little bit more secure now with the fence up with them going out back but um i still you know you still have this you know if you hear any craziness you know you still run out there but it's always out the back window listening out for them which i think we should do anyways <laughs> Do you have any ideas of why you think maybe the porch life of kids playing outside or even adults sitting out and conversing has changed over time? People are afraid. So people, mm, people do sit on the porch still, not as much like the lady across the street. She's an older lady, so she sits out on the porch and she watched the traffic go by. I sit out there sometimes and watch the traffic go by. A lot of people, they, they're they going in and out. They're not, I guess people don't care about, you know, it's community. You know, to me it was community. You walk past, you see someone sitting on their porch, you're high, you might stop and talk. But I guess people are just doing their own thing. They're going in and out. They go in the door, out the door. Sometimes they walk right past you, and they don't. They look a total different direction, so you can't speak to them. So, I guess it's just the mentality of people. We're gonna come in a little talk about a little bit about recreation within the home. I know when we toured your house initially, you talked about how your daughter would play in the house. Um, was there a concerted effort to try to also create a space that she had designated for her own recreation growing up? Her bedroom. <laughs> that was her recreation. But she was, that was for herself. So she had her bedroom. She had her toy box. She had her toys. Um, but she had run of the house, really, other than just in my living room was like off limits you cannot jump in the living room run in the living room but as far as our our um the den that we had she came because she was a on she was the only child so she liked to be up underneath us so she come in here and talk to us but her bedroom was her space so when she went in there she could close her door if she got angry with us she could close her door and mumble underneath her breath all she wanted to um, but that was her space, was her bedroom. So we even had her at one time when she got a little older, put her little phone in there so she could chit chat with her friends. So that was her space. What about your space for re recreation or relaxation? My bedroom is my space because my husband, he, he likes to sit in the den. So me, I close that bedroom door and I turn on my TV and I watch TV. That was my space because we don't have a lot of rooms. Now, once he uh, and and I could probably go in the back bedroom too because once my daughter moved, that's just a vacant bedroom. So I could have made it into a my own little space, but I I run the whole house. So <laughs> so and then at one time before my husband had his stroke, he would go down the basement. And what we call his man cave, but once he had the stroke, um, 
it kind of we just kind of use it as a storage area. We're trying to get it back so he can go back to his man cave and enjoy himself. Can we pause? I'm so sorry. That's all right. Just hear that in the flash. Turn that off. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. I said, phone phones go off all the time in this new <laughs> this new age of technology. <laughs> um, so when did your you and your husband kind of create the man cave? Was it initially when you moved in, or was it a couple years after? Mm, when we first moved in, and it was no man cave. It was after we purchased the property because we didn't want because we didn't own the property, even though even though the owner of the property was an excellent landlord. I couldn't. He was the best. And I'm sure he would not have a problem with my husband creating a man cave, but it was just that we didn't want to do that in his property. But it was after we purchased the property that he decided that that's where he wanted to go and so that was after that was may have been like the maybe 96 somewhere around there where he actually put him put him a little paneling down there and um put his little tv down there and my dad had some carpet that he had that he never used and he gave it to us and said let him put it down in the man cave because I was like, it's not going in my house. We don't put carpet on the floor that, up in my house. But um, my husband put it down there and um, he put his TV down there and hooked up his little stereo system. And that's where he put him a dartboard. And um, that's where he hung out. So, like I said, I had the run of the whole house. And he said, well, if I could just like to have my own room. Now, since he had the stroke, this is his space right here for the most part. But before the stroke, that basement was his little area. And did you ever use his little Oh, area? sure. <laughs> oh, sure. Because <laughs> I would keep my uh, computer down there, too. So sometimes I would go down there and get on the computer. And um, that was before the age of um, Wi-Fi. So once I got, we got Wi-Fi, then I moved on up here. But at the time before Wi-Fi, and I'm always on the computer, so I would go down there when he wasn't, down when he was at work. <laughs> and I would um, be down there on the computer, or when he um, came upstairs and I would go downstairs, on the, get on the computer, until he told me, it's time for you to go to bed. <laughs> Because I would stay on the computer sometimes late over in the night. And he's like, I know you're not still down there on the computer. But um, that's, um, that I did. And I did. Because like I said, I, I pretty much went wherever I wanted to in the house. And he said I bossed everything anyway. So I'm bossy. <laughs> so I know you mentioned that you put in um, a fence. How did you come to find the person that actually did that work or the painting of the house? Was it through neighbor uh, communication or was it your own research? Well, the fence, the first fence my husband did along with the guy next door. So we had a guy that lived next door and he helped my husband do a lot of little handy things around the house because my husband was, I always called him Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Because he would fix things, it would fall down, <laughs> he'd fix it again. And find. So certain things he would do himself. But the guy next door, he was always that extra hand. He was a little short guy. He had a twin brother. and But he was the one that would come, and my husband would give him a little, extra, little money to help him out. It didn't take much to um, make him happy. So my husband, he looked out for us also. We looked out for each other. So if he saw something suspicious in the neighborhood, he would let us know. And um, we'd let him know too. 
but he was the little guy that my husband could get to help him with just about anything. And they moved years ago, but my husband said, I sure do miss him <laughs> because he would, he never, I mean, he was so dependable when my husband asked him to help him. Now, the recent fence was through a friend of my daughter, her hu her father, my friend's, do my daughter's friend's father actually did this for us. So um, he just recently did it for us. So um, as far as painting the house, that was through, we went through the NID program for Sherman Park. Um, and um, they had a housing resource fair. And it was a, the company was Retherization Services. They were there. And it was so hard for me to find, we had to have several estimates. And uh, it was so hard for me to find people that would, was willing to paint this house. They didn't want to climb. So when I call them and I tell them that I wanted estimates, they either would say they were going to look at the house and call me back with the estimate, never heard from them, or they told me, no, we do not do three stories. Because when at first, you know, I'm thinking, well, it's a two-story home because it's a uh, um, duplex. And she said, do you have an attic? And I said, yes. She said, no. We don't do three-story homes. That's a three-story home. And I said, oh, that's why people drive by and never call me back. Because the way, I guess the way it's shaped, too, it's not just a flat roof. It, you know, this way the roofs are shaped. So I guess they just consider it a little more dangerous than climbing on other homes. So they said no. So the company that we used was really the only option that we had and we just let them do the whole thing we let them do the windows the tuck pointing and the glass block windows i mean the, the painting the glass black windows and the tuck pointing um is there anything else i know at the very beginning of our interview we talked about some of the things you still wanted to do but we didn't go into any real detail what are some of the things that you're still besides the maybe the basement that you might want to do or maybe that you know that your husband wants to do but you're like no he wants to remove this buffet and make an open concept kitchen and I'm like you better not touch it <laughs> you better not touch it because he don't I guess he don't look at the value of the woodwork and, and the details of things here at the house like I do um, but the bathrooms or something that I would really like to change up. Uh, he al we always talk about if we ever got into some real money, we might take up the bathroom because the back bedrooms and that back bedroom would make one big giant bathroom if once my daughter moves out, you know, and take it and make it into one big single family house. You know, that's what we were thinking about doing and opening up some of the rooms more. So like the, take the, bath bedroom and the bathroom and make it into one big bathroom and uh you know because bathrooms in here are so tiny you know it's just you know barely two people can get in you know if you got the one brushing their teeth and you know it's like it's so tiny in here so um you know just a open bathroom um take the upstairs and maybe make one giant bedroom up there you know and you know, make a big giant rec room or something. So it's just certain things that we dreamed of doing once my daughter and her husband decide to move out is certain things may take a little bit at a time and do to the house. Something more open. I mean, not without taking away the character of the house. mentioned that there was another tenant here when you moved here. Right. How did you interact within the space? Was it mainly on the porch or was it within each other's personal spaces? Um, we would be in each other's personal space sometimes. Sometimes they would have little um, like um, parties at the house or little events 
within the household and we would she would invite they would invite us or if we had something we'd invite them we had a Michael had his uh, 40th um, birthday surprise party and we gave him a surprise and had a picnic out back and this was after his friend passed away but she had another uh, uh, guy that she was with and we just invited um, them and we also not only uh invited them but um who like her um fiance the one that passed away we also uh communicated with his family too so he had a brother and his brother came around so her friends we would you know invite them also if you know uh we had something they were welcome to come if they were there you know so um we 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 became pretty close. We became pretty close. With them, did you mainly use the front doors or the back staircase? The back. Yep. So the back staircase, um, they'd come and knock on the door. I was um, combing, doing my daughter's hair, and I was pressing it. My daughter had thick, long hair, and my daughter would cry when I would do it, just like I did when I was a young girl, hollering, crying, ah, you know, just screaming. And she was screaming, and my daughter's hair was a lot easier to do than mine because of the new technology, and I was a cosmetologist. <laughs> so I'm doing her hair at home, and I'm pressing it, and she's screaming, and all of a sudden I hear a knock on the door. And it was Tyrone, the one I was telling you that passed away. And I said, come in. So he stood at the door, and he just stood there, and he looked at me. And I said, you thought I was killing her, didn't you? <laughs> he said, I was just coming down to see what was going on. And I said, well, I'm doing her hair. Now you see that I'm doing her hair, and she's a drama queen. And uh, so, um, we, that, you know, that's how we communicated, my, him and my husband. Sometimes we'd go places together. And like I said, they, they were closer than uh, me and his um, fiancé. But um, that's how we communicated. She would cook sometimes and invite us, you know, if she cooked. And if I cooked something and had more, we'd invite each other. So that's how we were. And then I had a tenant that moved here. Um, might have been in 2009, 2008. She was a good tenant, and she would cook. And she would invite us, bring us pies and things. So she was such a nice tenant, but all the good tenants always buy a home. So she bought a home, and we miss her dearly. But we still communicate with her. And uh, But uh, she also would cook and invite, because that was her specialty, is she liked to cook. I'm not a big cook. I don't care nothing about cooking. But she would actually cook, and if she barbecued, she would bring us a plate down. So, you know, we had good relationships with most of the people that lived upstairs over us. Um, now, you know, other than a couple, you know, some some people just not going to be good tenants no matter what. And so, therefore, once my daughter, I said, you know what, you can move in here. <laughs> I don't want anybody else over me. We'll just live in this house. If we got to live with the upstairs empty, we'll just do that. <laughs> But I don't want anybody else over me because you never know who you get. And I walked into, I had a tenant where I actually went down in my, because I let them use the basement to use the laundry room, which is two sides. And then you're welcome to put, hook up your washer and dryer. And I walked downstairs and walked into a man. And I'm like, oh, no, uh-uh, I can't do this. Who is this? And, oh, it's my brother. Well, your brother cannot wash in my house. He cannot. Well, it's my washing machine. I'm sorry, but it's my water, and it's my basement, and I don't ex intend to walk into strangers in my basement. This is my space. And so after I let one other person move in after her, and she was a good tenant. That's the one I was talking about. And after that, I just, I'm scared of who I would get in there. So I just told my daughter and her husband, move in with the kids. I like having the grandkids around me. So uh, I just prefer to have either her and her husband or nobody at all. Just 
me and my husband. And do your grandkids use the back staircase as well a lot? It's just, this is their house. <laughs> so they're up and down. And with uh, the, my oldest granddaughter, she said, this is her house. This is her house. She could, They come down, they have the run of the house. So they come downstairs and I hear the TV pop on in the kitchen. They're in there watching TV. And they may go and get them something to eat. But I let them have the run of the house. This is their house. And I'm their grandparents. So if I see something, I mean, I get them just like their mother gets them if they do something. So my daughter has the run of the house, too. We sleep and we hear her coming in and getting stuff. So <laughs> I just heard her this morning. I'm like, what are you in the house, Stilly? <laughs> I'm getting a marker, you know. So, I mean, I enjoy having them here. I really do. And I feel safe with them here because my daughter was a big help to us when my mother, my husband had his stroke. So having them here really has been a great help to us because her and her husband stepped in when my husband had his stroke and when I got sick. So it's always good to have family around you. So I, the grandkids, they, they are a big help too. She just, the oldest one just went out and helped my husband pick up some stuff out the yard. So it's good to have them in the neighbor, you know, in the, in the, in the home with us. Um, I want to talk because I've noticed some lovely art pieces and family photos and one time. So I wanted to know what was, how did you approach personalizing this space to fit your family and your family's personality? I always loved African art. I always loved that. That's something I always loved. And um, I didn't want to make it too feminine. <laughs> you know, so in my so I had to fit something that I really liked, along with some masculinity. So I didn't want it to be florally, uh, more abstract. And uh, I I like abstracts. And my husband had to get on me because I like black. <laughs> so it's like no more black. I mean, I like black cars, black clothes, <laughs> and black furniture. <laughs> But uh, I like African art, and so I have a cousin that has traveled. He, he works for, well, his, his business, he's a choreographer in New York, and he travels all over the world. And one of the places that he traveled a lot is in Africa. So some of the pieces that um, he came back with some African pieces for me because he know I like Art. But I also bought a lot of pieces from down at the African World Fest. Um, when I go somewhere, if I see some African work art, I pick it up. And to the point now, I'm like, no more. <laughs> I mean, some just enough, too much stuff to have to dust. <laughs> but I, I love African art. Is there um, a piece or that is like that kind of encapsulates? Which is your favorite? I don't think I really have any favorites. I don't. <laughs> I don't have any favorites. I have my some artwork from a black artist that's in my um, cabinets, in my um, curio cabinets over there, is from Thomas Blackshear. And, um, that those pieces probably are some of my favorite, but I did not know of him. My father-in-law is the person that actually introduced me to Thomas Blackshear, and um, it was when I had some. He had bought me a plate, and the plate. Oh, I can't. I want to say was it called the protector? And um, we had it sitting over there. And um, I had a cleaning service that was cleaning for me. Mary Mays was my cleaning services. And Mary Mays was cleaning and they broke it. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, my, it was a sentimental value to me because my father-in-law had bought it for us. And so uh, they said, well, we will replace it or fix it. So I'm like, well, if it's something, I have to look this up. So I looked it up, 
And when I looked it up, I was in shock because the piece was at that time $395. I'm like, oh my God, did he actually pay $395 for this piece? <laughs> and so uh, I looked all over the place where it was a retired piece of Thomas Blackshear. So I looked, I told him, I said, I looked it up. I'm trying to find it. It's $395 right now. And they said, oh, my God, can we just piece it together? I'm like, no, you can't piece a, a piece of art like that together. I said, um, well, I, I, went, I said, I'll try to find it. So I called this place somewhere. I think they were in Florida, Roberta's place. And they had retired pieces of Thomas Blackshear. And they sold it to me for like $295. So they were like, okay, we'll just pay the two ninety five. So I ended up getting it replaced, and I started looking at his pieces. And I'm like, he got some nice pieces of art. And I would buy a little bit here and there, and Roberta's Place would let you put it, uh, pay on it, you know, like in three installments. So I would buy it, and before they would ship it, I would just pay, pay it off. And um, I just started collecting pieces of it. And so that is some of my favorite artwork is uh, Thomas Blackshear. Even bought my daughter a couple of pieces. I, I think I, I really love the artwork around here. I'm glad you like it. Some of it my mother-in-law bought me because she know I like African art and zebra print. So she bought me some pieces too. <laughs> I also noticed that you have a lot of wind chimes. I like wind chimes. I love them. I love to hear them outside. Now I have one outside. I don't hear it too much, but I had one in the back and then it kind of got, I got one in the kitchen, but I'm going to take it and hang it outside. But I like the serenity of the sound. So when I'm sitting outside in my back, we would sit on our bench, my husband and I, and just listen to the wind chimes. We get up like sometime early in the morning or late in the evening when it's kind of cooled off a little bit and just listen to the sounds of the wind chimes. It's just so relaxing. I love wind chimes. And I said, I was going to, now that we got our backyard gated in again, I'm putting my wind chimes right back out there. And we're going to sit out there and enjoy the sound. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> uh, I want to move towards more of the streetscape of the neighborhood okay. and talk about what you think or feel when you see homes that are foreclosed or you see a family that has had to leave their home and how that affects you personally and the neighborhood. It bothers me. I hate to see people lose their homes and I also hate to see those borders because they are a hub for squatters. Um, we had a board up over next to us at one time. Matter of fact, these two houses on the north and the south of us in the past have been our, what you would call, problem homes. The one on the north, not so bad now and wasn't as bad years ago as the one once the guy moved out. It was a family that lived over here, a whole family that lived over there. And my husband got a chance, we got a chance to know the guy over there much more than the wife and the kids. But he decided that he was moving, him and his family were moving out to West Dallas. I guess the neighborhood had started changing and he just wanted to move. Well, he moved out and he moved the family in, which was a beautiful family. She had a daycare inside. She was a nice lady. She stayed there for years. But once she moved out, all chaos. I mean, we have only one time we got somebody after this lady moved out. And he had maybe about six children, but he was a single father and he raised his kids. And he was, you could tell he had those kids in line. But ever since then, it was whoever they moved in. I'm like, did they get them from the same place? Because it was always chaotic. They trash, 
tear up the property, noise nuisance. Um, over here after the guy that I was talking about that used to help my husband, he they moved out. House went into foreclosure because his mother passed away and she left the house, I guess, in an estate. And they lost the house. Then squatters came. And they partied. And we had to call the police. So that was a problem with the squatters. So when people move out and you see board ups, squatters come in and make it into a party house. And trash. And who knows what's going on in the house. So it bothers me to see that we have board ups. I wish the banks would do a little bit more because a lot and 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 uh absentee landlords, I wish they would do more with their properties and bring more quality tenants in or require more from their tenants instead of letting their tenant you know, they say, Well, we just we, we they pay their rent. And I'm like, but they're tearing up the neighborhood. We have to live here. I've had people that rent that were good renters that lived in the neighborhood and they said oh we're moving and I'm like oh my god here we, you know what are they going to get next and then they'll say well we we can't live here we're moving and I told one young lady I said I don't have an option to move I own my property and I love my property I don't have that option to just pick up and move and with the property value going down with all I have put into my property I wouldn't get nothing out of it to sell it. You know, what I put in, we'd probably even sell it, you know, end up selling it for less than, you know, maybe a, less than what we paid for it. We didn't pay that much for the property, but we put a lot more into it. We put siding on it because it was cedar. We put windows in it, had wood windows. We put windows in it, got the land moved out, we got new furnaces, we got central air. We put a lot into our property to watch other properties around us just decay and fall apart. It, it's, it's disheartening. It hurts to see this. And I wish more people would care. I wish more renters would care. I wish renters would um, look at it like we did when we rented. We looked at it as we live here. And where we live is not a representation of the owner of the property, it is a representation of us that come in and out that door. And we want it to look nice, even though we don't own the property. We live here and we want where we live. I don't care if we live 10, 20, 30 years here. We want it to look nice. And if we see paper going down the street, we take a day out and clean up the paper. And that's what we do here. But we find people that rent, they don't care. We talk to the neighbors and say, we're having a neighborhood cleanup, you know. And if they're renting, they really don't care. They'll walk, watch us clean up and tell us thank you. And I'm like, but you live here. We're cleaning out in front of your house, paper that you've thrown down. And some people just don't care. What do you think is a solution to to change that behavior or change the type of tenants that are coming in? I think homeowners need to be held more accountable. Uh, even though we have laws about certain things, they just pretty much, um, and people are afraid to. So people are afraid to call, contact the city about nuisance properties. So you talk to people and they'll complain about it to me and I'll say, well, you know, call your city, call the city because what they're doing is not um, city ordinance, you know, but I need, I think landlords need to be more held accountable too. And I think that uh, banks see that if people are losing their properties, because some people got into these mortgages that were predatory or whatever. And uh, I think that, you know, and the, the mortgages have been sold from over here to over there. And then once people lose their properties, the banks don't win. I think they should work more with the, um, the homeowners that 
can't pay and say, okay, we don't want the property. They don't want the property. The banks don't want the property. So what happens is the property sits there, squatters come in, they tear up the property, and then the bank is worthless to the banks because when they sell it, they have to do a short sale a lot of times. So I think the banks should work with the property owners to help keep them in their property, you know, because they, they've lost out also. So I think it, it has to be a change of the community thinking. Uh, people have to care more, even the renters. And the homeowners have to be held accountable to what their properties look like. Because, you know, they come and do a patchwork. And then the city, they're so busy doing so many other things, they, a lot of times they just don't have the time. So it, it takes all of us to come together. All of us, as far as the community, uh, more organization, that's what it takes. Well, I don't have any other questions. Did, Caitlin, did you have something to add? Um, I, I did have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned your, your grandkids helping you water the flowers out on the porch. Um, what, how, this, um, how does that process go as far as, you know, what, what determines where you put, place the flowers? Because I know you mentioned you place the, the flowers are out on the front porch, correct? But then you've also mentioned that it, it feels a little less safe in the front than in the back. Um, you let your kids play out in the back a little more so. Um, than in the front. So placing those flowers out there, is that for curb appeal or how, how, how does that process? It's for, well, it's for, I, I love flowers. And if you saw my, I would have had a lot more flowers out there this year. If you saw last year, I could probably pull up the pictures of my flowers last year. I had a lot more flowers because I love the look of flowers. So it is curb appeal. I love flowers. I like when I ride past my house to see the flowers and and, and, some, and a lot of times it make other people in the neighborhood bring out their flowers like they tease uh, Miss Carson's son tease me he said me and his mother has a, have a flower competition <laughs> and last year um, one of the ladies um, on 38th Street she had a bunch of flowers that the city had donated to her to put in the parks and you know give to some name. So I she gave me a bunch of flowers and I gave I had so many I took across the street to the lady across the street. But um I it, I like flowers. I like the way they look. And I think it makes people see that you care also. So um that's another thing too. So like when one see somebody put out a flower, then somebody else might put out a flower. Then somebody further down the street might. So it's like a chain reaction to see, you know, when one see another put out flowers. And um, so I, I love flowers. I'm, I like perennials because you don't have to plant them every year, which I have some on the side that I need to plant. But see, they've been working on my house, so they've been kind of in my way as far as planting flowers because I don't want them trampling on them. So some of the flowers I had bought previously through uh, Sherman Park Bloom and Groom, and some of them died because I was waiting to plant them. But uh, I have some perennials I'm going to plant on the side of the house. Um, and uh, I'll probably put some more hanging baskets. I got these little shepherd's rods, put those in the backyard. We had some at one time, a flower box on the fence. So we had flowers in the backyard too, which kind of made it pretty too. But uh, I like, I just like the look of flowers. It's be they're beautiful. So it, it, it almost becomes a community effort then, kind of, once you start putting out those flowers. Right, right, then other people see. And so if I start uh, putting them out, and then um, the lady across the street, her son said, my mom's wondering, where are your flowers? And I'm like, I'm waiting on them to finish putting up, doing my house. <laughs> he said, I told her that. <laughs> so I was just waiting on them to, uh, you know, 
finish my house. That's what I was waiting on. Um, I did have one other question, and then that's, that's it. But, okay. Um, you have mentioned that if your daughter ever moves out, um, you would maybe make that upstairs space kind of a recreational space. Um, so right now, I, from what I can see, this kind of feels like your space to be the, the room that we're in, the, um, the sitting room, basically. Right. So should you um, decide to um, renovate that upper space to be a more recreational space? Would you imagine this being more of a formal space, maybe moving a table in? I here? might. I might just do that. He wants to take it and make it into an open area kitchen. <laughs> And I'm like, you better not. I prefer to, you know, even upstairs they got the buffet. I don't want to touch any of that. So even if I um, was to take, you know, the kitchen upstairs and make it into a big open airy kitchen and kind of tear off into it into the other bedroom or something like that, you know, I might be willing to do that. It's according. To, I'm not an architectural person, but, you know, it's a certain way, you know, certain designs that we look to, you know, would love to have but I'm not a big kitchen person so I don't really I don't cook that much so I don't really have to have a huge kitchen you know just enough to move around in but I know that um these houses when they built them they didn't they you know I guess the living room and the, the dining area were the bigger areas bedrooms are eh, I mean I've seen smaller bedrooms in other places but um, the bathroom is so tiny and the bedrooms are, you know, smaller. And the kitchen is smaller to me, too. <laughs> so is there anything that we haven't asked you that you wanted to talk about? I think I said, I know I probably answered more questions than you guys <laughs> wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, you did amazing. I, I've learned so much about you, the neighborhood, even more than what I've read you brought a lot of things to life mm -hmm. by also adding your personal uh, anecdotes and experiences here which i truly appreciate and i know those who are going to be listening to this are going to appreciate as well okay well i'm glad i could be of some help i i like i said i love my neighborhood and i always said i said if i get rich i'm not gonna move and my husband said yes you will <laughs> but but i love my house so if I could just pick it up, some, you know, and just take it with me, you know, somewhere a little more quiet, maybe, you know. But I like neighborhoods. I like knowing people. Thank you, Mrs. Robinson. You're welcome. Once again, this is Joy Huntington. I'm with interviewing Mrs. Robinson at her residence, and it is July 11, 2017. And this is for the BLC, Field School for UW-Milwaukee. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You did amazing. Well, I'm glad that I could help you guys. And I'm going to um, get gather up some pictures. My daughter might be even better at it because she gather them up and put them on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Do you have um, a Regent's email to send you, them? You know what? Or? Let me see here. Let me see if I got this email. Uh... I'm going to my contacts here because I know I got this phone number here. Uh -oh. I don't have his email here. He, it might be, but you know what? I'm. Do you have it? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. Hold on one second. I'm going to put it in here. Okay, what is it? S E N A S E N A at U W M at U W M dot E D U dot E D U. Okay. S E N A at U W M dot E D U. Correct. Okay, I'm gonna save it. Okay, and then what I'll do is I will um Gather up some pictures. I'll 
see if I can get some gathered up tonight and tomorrow. See what we can gather up. How soon do you need them? I think next week is when we kind of start collecting all of our stuff and putting it all together. So. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I'll gather maybe, maybe by like the end of the week. Okay, okay. Yeah. And okay. is there anybody else that you think that we should possibly talk to that we don't know about? Mm. You know what? The man across the street, he was gone. He's sick. His son lives over there, but I saw him. We can't get him to do much. Um, you guys are going to interview Miss Washington, right? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, it. down. Because she's been here like 50, I think it's 50 something years. Mm -hmm. So she's probably seen a lot more. She was been here like right after I was born or something. <laughs> Cause I, yeah, I think she said she came in the 60s and then um you guys are going to interview diane right yes diane yes. um yeah. Tharp. Yeah, yeah okay and then sue did sue didn't want to be in interviewed i think he said because that was okay. one of the ladies my daughter used to play with her oh. daughter but she didn't want it i think she Correct. didn't want to do it yes yeah, she was on the list of not Okay, okay. Do you know, would your daughter be interested in either, even just doing like a quick interview with? with I can them? ask her. Okay. Uh huh, I can ask her because she probably know more about the kids playing than I do. Her, and yeah. so, yeah. So, so she, I, she grew up here. I mean, right? You said she moved, you she, guys moved in here when she was five. She was five. Five? Mm hmm. She okay. was five years old and she's 38 now. Okay. Yeah. So. So, yep. She's still young. Yeah, Very she's. Young. Yeah. She said 38? She's 38. That's your age. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said she's young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's real young. Yeah. Yeah, she's young to me. <laughs> yes. One other quick thing. Do you, can, do you mind if I take a pic, any pictures of the artwork that you had mentioned by that one sure, artist? Sure, sure. This is in the cabinet right here of Thomas Blasher. As a matter of fact, I have three. This is the one, let me see, and I could probably turn on the light and it's on the And we'll also need a photo of you, so wherever you want to situate yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see here, I can plug this, because they have lights in them, and sometimes I unplug them.
just unplug the other plug. And I, don't, I think that plug might go. Is that the plug? This one is, because this is the black one. Okay, yeah, I'll just unplug that plug. Oh, sorry, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Well, it'll be back on in a minute. <laughs> I forgot your thing was hooked on to that. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it'll give your TV a good boot. <laughs> You can come back into your den. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me move out the way. You can turn back on your TV. I'm so sorry to disturb you oh, today. Man. You're just such a trooper. And you said all of these except for the candles, right? Right, the candles and that little piece in the middle. My sister and her husband in Atlanta a lot of African heart, like a okay. close friend of ours. She's like our sister. She's originally from Ghana. Okay. Okay. Um, so she'll, whenever she's there, she'll get stuff for her. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So some of the pieces in here, are, my cousin brought me that piece. Uh, did we get that piece in Saint Lucia, right there? And then my nephew brought me that piece from Africa. That's gorgeous. Yeah, he brought me that piece from Africa. My nephew brought me this, I mean, my uh, cousin brought me that piece from Africa right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought me these from Africa, too. And this. So he's always bringing me pieces from Africa when he calls. So you know I like African pieces. Can you get a picture of one of the witch hands? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because then we can put um, do the clip of uh, witch hands when Mrs. Robinson was Oh, you're okay. <laughs> Yeah, my um, Amma, she always works with brands like foot fluffs and spices. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, like the, the hand ones that they do. And uh -huh. like, uh, this the spice that my one of my sisters went right there with her. She's like, you just watch them. It's fresh and they just ground in my yeah. hand. And it smells so good. Yeah, my nephew, you all, I mean, my cousin always brings me something from Africa. If it's not a wallet, he brought me a, uh, they were making button jewelry. So he brought me a button ring they made, and he brought me a handmade wallet. So he brings me different things from um, Africa. So I appreciate that. I absolutely love that. Yes, with all the women. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I get stuff and it's so long ago <laughs> that I forget, but I got it. My daughter gave me a picture I put behind the couch back there and I haven't found a place to put it yet. I don't know where to put it. <laughs> My mom, she, uh, she rotates her, her okay. images. Oh, okay. So when one of the kids come home, she puts us to work. Oh, and have <laughs> so you guys rotate? Change all the pictures out. Yeah. But my dad's like, well, she's getting rid of something. Well, not the best picture for a button. <laughs> well, you took enough shots. You took a couple of them to come out. <laughs> you want to get a picture of Mrs. Robinson? Where yeah. do you want to stand? Uh, I guess I could just stand right here, huh? Okay. Not you, just the, the quality. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, 
like, look how funky they come out. Yeah. You look beautiful, but <laughs> the image itself. Haze. Yeah. I don't. So I got a picture with my phone. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, some of those pictures will turn out. Oh, this is another piece he brought me from Africa too. It's not art. It's this. Uh, What's art? But he brought me that from Africa too. My sofa is so old. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll just throw some thralls on it. It's a gorgeous throw though. Do you understand that? Yeah, I just because my sofa, my furniture is so old and I want to get new furniture, but I can't find anything that I really, really like yet. And now I'm hearing things like, oh, the stuff they make now don't have a lot of real wood in it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Maybe I should just get it reupholstered. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to find quality furniture that lasts. My dad's of the opinion that you buy something so it can last. Right, right. And this furniture is old, mm -hmm. real old, like 80s old. Like when we first moved, before we moved. So this furniture we bought in the early 80s. The only thing we, is newer is the tables and stuff. Is it coming? It's slowly, coming. Slowly but surely. There you go. So you guys got to head back to Madison. You got more interviews today. We have another one today. Um, is it Miss Miss Washington? Yeah, today? she she actually she was the one who tried calling me during the interview. Oh, okay. So, and I called her before and she said that she wasn't feeling very well. So, oh, I hope she's doing okay. Yeah. We haven't had a chance to meet her yet. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, she's 70. Did she tell me she was 78? Yeah. I never met her. I talked to her. Okay. On the phone several times. Everybody's been so friendly and Good, I'm glad everybody's been real friendly. How's it, how's it going? You got, now, are you guys staying at the house down here? She he said on um, 2500 block. I know he said some of the students were staying at the houses on 2500 block on 40th Street. Or down there at the library, too. We, we're stationed at the library. Okay. Most of our work. Oh, maybe it's the house that they're working on down there. 